Good morning and welcome to worship this morning. I have an exciting reminder. In two weeks, if the regulations stick, we will be meeting in person February 14th, Valentine's Day. So keep that in mind and write that on your calendars. Um, Jeff and I have a really good friend, Tom, who is very faithful in sending out scripture verses every morning. And last week I got the scripture verse and it so encouraged me. I probably was in a little bit of a, a weary state and he sent it and I was just so blessed. And it just happens that this week's scripture is the one he sent. It is Matthew 18, 28 to 30. Then Jesus said, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. And then from another translation, Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Let's pray. Lord, we take these words to heart that you are with us and we can be so tired and so weary of everything that's going on but we look to you and from your words we know that you won't give us anything except what you have for us and that your burden is light and so lord we are grateful and we love you and we give you this morning as we worship together in jesus name amen continuing our series on purpose, our purpose as partners with God in building God's kingdom. But living our purpose can be very difficult. Sometimes we get weary. Sometimes keeping on, keeping on gets old and difficult. For Kathy and me, this pandemic is a challenge. Uh, it's wearying at times and the daily routine, you know, that can get old. We, the two of us, are energized by vision, working with people, working toward God's kingdom together. Uh, but like you, we are on lockdown. 
Uh, the weather is dreary, things are closed. Uh, we are limited to connecting through the computer screen and that computer screen can be deadening at times and um, all the rest, so it's hard. And at least she and I have each other, but you might be alone. You uh, might be worried about finances because you've lost a job, somebody might be sick, and there's uncertainty. Well, what do we do with that? Last week's message uh, ended with the power of the cross, the power of the God's forgiveness through the cross, Jesus' death for our sins, his resurrection. And the amazing passage in Romans 8 was, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You and I no longer have to live, even though we know there's something gone wrong deep within us, because of the cross, we've been forgiven and set free. We no longer have to live under that low lying cloud of guilt and condemnation. The, the clouds of sin and darkness have been blown away by God's ferocious love. Um, and so we can breathe deep the breath of God. But what happens when forces outside of our control keep working against that full of life life that God offers us. Um, let's keep reading in Romans 8. And I'm going to read from the message paraphrase. It, Romans 8 is brilliant. Everybody should read that over and over and over again until it's etched in our hearts, in our minds. Uh, but the way Paul writes it requires some understanding and, and the message, I think, nails it. Uh, exactly Paul's point. He says in 8.2, there is a new power in operation. So just when you feel weak and powerless, we learn that the Bible is saying there's a new power to live on. And then Paul says this, those who think they can live this life of God, live their purpose on their own, will end up obsessed with measuring their own moral muscle, but never get around to exercising it in real life. It's as if each of us has a ladder, a moral goodness ladder within us. At the top is God, at the bottom is Hitler, and if we were to put ourselves somewhere on this goodness ladder, we would probably put ourselves somewhere in the middle so that we can say, at least I'm not as bad as these people. And though I'm not as good as them, at least, you know, I, there I am. And the problem is, is when we look up, we get discouraged by not being good enough. As we look down, we can get prideful. And as I exercise my moral muscle, try to climb one rug at a time a little bit better and better. If I succeed, again, I look down in my nose at those who don't. But more likely, it's like we learned last week in Romans 7. When I try to do good, I don't. When I try not to do bad, I do bad anyway. There is something deeply within me that has gone wrong. This, and, and it, the worst thing of all, this is all about me and not about Christ. Paul says there is a completely different way to live, and here it is. Those who trust God's action in them find that God's spirit in them, that's the new power, living and breathing God offers a new way to live. In other words, here's his point. Relying on yourself, your own moral muscle, doesn't work. Relying on the Holy Spirit within you does work. That's exactly what is being said here in Romans 8. Verse 11, listen to this. That same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you and will give life to your mortal body. The same power that took a dead Jesus, raised him from the dead, exists within you. What a thought. You are delivered, says Paul from that dead, do-it-yourself 
life. You are delivered from this into this. I've shown you this picture before. This is sort of a picture of God, but it's really a picture of the power of God as well. Here we see the Father and the Holy Spirit and the Son. And the Father pours himself out as the Spirit. And the Spirit gives himself over to the Son. And the Son submits and gives himself over to the Father. And the Father pours his love into the Son. And the Son submits and loves. It's, it's, a, it's a submitting, deferring, serving a dynamic. And here's what you notice. The power, just like in an atom where neutrons, electrons, positrons, all those things are flowing, the energy isn't in the particle so much as it is in between them, in the relationship between them. Here's the power in the connection, in the flow, in the love, in the submission. Notice that it's a picture of a flow. And ancient theologians would call this the divine dance. Each centers on the other. None demands that the other revolves around him. And it's a serving and outpouring a loving relationship. Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve were in this dance, but they chose to sing a different song. Uh, I did it my way. And they sort of danced themselves off into their own world. And they were lost. They lost the power. They lost the dance. They lost the relationship. But God, by means of the cross, by the means of his spirit at work within us, is always working to reach out and pull you and me back into the dance. I remember in high school, after a basketball game, I had gone to a high school dance and uh, I was terrible. I was shy, backward, and I always stood against the wall by myself. But a young woman, I still remember her, what she looks like, and I remember her name. Her name was Sharon. She came up and took me by the hand and pulled me onto the dance floor. I don't remember what happened after that. I just remember that as I look back, that was just like God pulling me back in to the dance. Kathy and I, attended uh, several years ago dances back home in our hometown where my brother would go to dances. There would be a band on the stage. Uh, a, an instructor would teach us the steps. He would get all of us in a circle and he would teach us. Here's how to do it. Step, step, quick step, 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 quick step. And before I was ready, before I really knew the steps, uh, he would pair us up with a partner. And I can remember one time Kathy being over there with my brother and I had his partner. I, I, hadn't, I didn't know her at all. She didn't know me. And we started doing these steps. And even though I was doing them wrong and she was doing them correctly, somehow a flow began to develop. Even in my missteps, what I discovered was that not then, but as I look back on it, there is a power at work between us, you and me, just like in God, that is more than me. It's in the flow. It's in the rhythm. It's in the relationship. As I look back at my efforts to live the Christian life, especially in times of discouragement and when there are bumps in the road, what worked for me was not mechanically memorizing steps and legalistically following them and then trying to impose those steps onto others. It was not my exercising my moral muscle in trying to climb the ladder or do the steps right and getting others to do them right. 
It was in letting God pull me back onto the dance floor with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, just the four of us alone, in solitude, in prayer, in surrender, in trust, in the relationship where I would pour myself out to him and he would pour himself out to me and something in that relationship gave a new power to live on. And then out of that, I could go into the day and approach others, not as people who need to be fixed, but as people I need to invite into the dance. I still need to be constantly reminded of this. When will I ever fully have this as my second nature? But now I can say in my best no moments, I can tell the difference between telling someone how to dance and inviting them into the dance. And you can too if you practice. You can feel the difference between a force fit and a flow. You can feel the difference between pushing people too hard and working with them where they are. You can feel it at work when you allow rules to become more important than relationship. You can feel it in parenting when enforcing rules and making demands and maintaining standards becomes more important than loving and listening and playing and just being. You can feel it in marriage when the dance becomes all about getting your spouse to dance to your tune and your steps rather than flowing together to the beat of the Holy Spirit. One is exercising my moral muscle to minimal avail and it tends to be hard and lifeless and is often just boring. The latter is, as Kathy read at the beginning of the worship service, the unforced rhythms of grace. Now, don't get me wrong. The steps matter. There are times when Kathy and I are on the dance floor and she will stop me and she say, Jeff, you're doing the steps wrong. Let's get them right. And I say, Kathy, can't we just flow? But I'm grateful for the steps that she is reminding me of because if it weren't for her, I'd probably flow myself right off the dance floor. Your job and mine with this new power at work within us is to be on the dance floor. First alone with God and then with God and others allowing God to call the steps, submitting to the flow of the Holy Spirit who will not direct you wrongly, rejoicing in the Son who forgives your missteps, and to gently invite others on to the dance floor with you, where they can meet the da dance master themselves, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I love, love, love this next song.
now unto him who is able to carry you and to do exceedingly more than all that you can hope or imagine according to his power at work in you. To him be glory in the church and in Jesus Christ throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. We'll see you in a few minutes on Zoom. Just click on the link that you were sent uh, uh, yesterday. And uh, I hope to see you all uh, in a few minutes. God bless everybody. Bye-bye.